Uh, welcome to Talk Mental Health with Logan Noon. Uh, there's four of us here today, the first group interview I've ever done. So this is pretty cool. I'm here with uh, two of my favorite professors and one of my favorite classmates. Uh, could each of you go around and quickly just give a brief synopsis of uh, your background and what you do today? Hi, I'm Dr. Albert Brady. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist by training, and currently I'm an associate professor of medicine at Pacific Northwest University here in Yakima. Nick Lalani, I'm a second year student at Pacific Northwest University and uh, in the midst of studying for step one and level one. So this is a, a nice little break from that. And I'm excited to have this conversation because it's, uh, I feel like, a difficult answer with a lot of gray area and uh, needs to be more openly discussed. I'm Dr. Mark Baldwin. I'm a uh, nephrologist by training and I am the chair of the Department of Internal Medicine here at uh, Pacific Northwest University in Yakima, Washington. And I'm, of course, Logan. I'm pursuing a career in psychiatry, and I am pursuing psychiatry because of my own experiences with bipolar disorder, and I never really envisioned that uh, physician-assisted suicide is going to be a big part of my career, especially if I practice in the Pacific Northwest, where it's currently legal. So uh, let's get started. Uh, so I guess we should remind the listeners that, you know, we're going to be talking about physician-assisted uh, death and suicide, which is legal in some places and not legal in others. Uh, we have listeners from all 50 states, uh, like 10 different countries at the moment. So you do need to check with where what your <coughs> laws are, wherever you're listening from. But also we want this conversation to serve as a way to help you advocate if this is something that you feel passionate about. So I guess the uh, first question to both of you doctors is, have you ever referred any patients to uh, follow through with this procedure uh, of physician-assisted death? I have. And it obviously is instigated at the patient's request. There are, as you alluded to, extensive requirements uh, Many patients inquire about it and don't go farther than that. Um, they, I think we all agree that we should be certain that they're not suffering from a treatable problem, pain that can't be controlled, depression, uh, are probably the classic uh, retorts from people who oppose physician-assisted suicide, they assume that all symptoms can be controlled, and if a patient's uh, symptoms were all controlled, that would eliminate the patient's concerns and the patient's request for uh, uh, help in dying. Mm -hmm. so can I, what, what are the medications that are, are used? And if I'm correct, it's physician-assisted suicide in the United States is when we prescribe and distribute pills that they take home and take versus euthanasia, which is not legal here, where we, the physician would actually inject a medication. Correct. And in Washington State, the medication is a barbiturate, the high-dose barbiturate. Um, I would point out to you, though, we do a lot of things to patients that result in their deaths. Unfortunately, sometimes accidentally, but we do a lot of deliberate things that result in patients' deaths, other than write a prescription. We do palliative removal of ventilator relatively frequently, and that's perfectly legal in, as near as I know, all 50 states. Um, and Dr. Baldwin can speak to the uh, discontinuation of dialysis. I, from my perspective, there are two key aspects to this from the patient's side. One is control. The patient wants control of a situation in which they feel they're out of control or that things are out of control. Um, and for many patients, that's extremely important. They wish to choose its circumstances uh, of uh, their death. I would like to kind of add something to what Dr. Brady said. Um, I have not um, recommended any patients. However, I have had patients inquire as to this that have not followed through or nature has taken its course. 
<clears throat> there is a spectrum which we which patients and physicians are on of at one end is physician assist overt physician assisted suicide and the other and at the other extreme of uh, varying degrees of withholding care uh, to avoid prolonging suffering and I think it's I think this all <laughs> it's okay we'll edit that out thanks <laughs> Um, there are um, times when uh, patients want to cease care, but I think one of the fundamental aspects of anything on this spectrum, which I think also involves a greater um, view of patient care, is communications between patients and physicians. Uh, without that, I think nothing can be accomplished. And I think that recognizing that our ultimate our obligation is to our patients and our patients needs and our patients desires so you guys you know you're a nephrologist you're an oncologist i kind of view your role is you were the first doctor in line that maybe this patient had this conversation with you know i i realize i have this terminal uh condition uh it's not going to end very pleasantly for me uh they talk to you first but then what happens after that in my experience, um, and especially with a patient who has a number of comorbid conditions uh, or and or who's older, if I start them, if we decide to proceed with dialysis, um, I kind of have the same uh, conversation with most patients that, you know, this is here to make you feel better. If we get to a point, or more when we get to a point down the road, where you don't feel this is keeping a quality of life that you would like to have going, we can stop at any time. And I think giving patients that escape option is something, I, at least in nephrology, is very important. I mean, the whole area of nephrology, palliative care, is a uh, growing uh, sub subspecialty of nephrology, but I think again it comes back to communication. Um, Doctor Brady, yeah, no, I would agree. I I, I was also going to speak to the issue of patient autonomy. I mean, I think that's a critical central piece of all of this, and we're here really to serve the patient, and patients do or want funny things that uh, we don't necessarily or aren't necessarily comfortable providing uh, and many physicians are not uh, comfortable providing a prescription that if the patient takes it will result in the patient's death. But I think it's important to note that many phys patients don't take the prescription. They want the prescription. They want to have the pills. They want that at least sense of control, but they don't um, move forward. In the most recent uh, report from the state of Oregon, only about two-thirds of patients actually took the medication. On the other hand, although it is pretty much a stock position on the part of most profe physician professional organizations that we should not write a prescription that if the patient takes might result in their death. Um, there is a rising number of physicians uh, that in fact do that. And, and again, in the most recent Oregon report, the numbers went up by, if I recall, close to 50%. I can actually give you the number. Um, there were, in 2016, 102 uh, physicians wrote prescriptions and in 2017, um, actually the number went down, I'm sorry, it was 92. But it, there's a fair number of physicians uh, who are willing to do this. And the flip side, as I said earlier, is that in a situation where it's either at the patient's request or when the medical team feels that 
what we're doing is really not in the patient's best interest, that we're prolonging their death or their uh, discomfort, even agony, um, we may do an overt act, stop antibiotics, stop dialysis, discontinue a ventilator that directly results in the patient's pretty much immediate death. Whereas when you write a prescription, the patient has the option to take them next week, next month, or never. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the distinction between uh, writing a prescription as being something that's of questionable appropriateness and taking away a ventilator, which is going to directly result in a patient's death, is an artificial distinction. Mm -hmm. Now, for whatever reason, the society at large and many physicians are very comfortable with that, um, and they feel strongly about that difference. Uh, I would submit to you that most ethicists would tell you that ethically, there really isn't a difference, mm -hmm. that those are the same kinds of interventions. Yeah, I'm, I mean, being a second-year student, still trying to grasp the whole very controversial debate on this. But for me right now, it's hard to see, is this really, does this really come down to a religious debate, like on one side opposing it because of belief in Christianity that you should not take your own life, and then on the other side of that, not being someone... Maybe, I mean, if you are religious or not, but um, is, I don't, uh, it's hard to see like the difference between, or, or the reasoning behind it at, in the end. I don't think, from my perspective, it's a religious issue. I mean, I ran a palliative care team in Michigan uh, for a number of years. We had people of all faiths. There are people who, perhaps justifying it by their faith or for other reasons, believe that as long as the heart is beating, there's hope mm -hmm. and um, want everything done always until a, some kind of catastrophe happens. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Baldwin alluded earlier to the issue of communication, and I think that's probably the most important thing is that the patients and the families understand where they are with their disease. And we're generally talking about uh, people who are in a situation where death is inevitable and they have to decide, um, is the process that they're going through one that's acceptable to them and they're going to do this naturally, or do they wish to intervene? at some point. Let me give you an example. And I participated in the AIDS epidemic in the early years when, first of all, we didn't understand what was going on. And second, we had really no tools to treat these patients. And one of the most devastating complications was dementia. And uh, I had a young man come to me and ask for a prescription before this was legal to uh, uh, so that he, he knew what was going to happen and he didn't want his family and friends <coughs> to have to take care of him and he didn't want to live like that and he wanted to be able to say at this point uh, I want things over and the only thing at that juncture we could refer him to was the uh, manual by the uh, Hemlock Society which is still out there uh, and it, the reality is that manual makes the physicians unnecessary anyway. Uh, what, what, can you, yeah. Yeah, what is that manual? The Hemlock Society publishes a, menu, um, a, a manual which discusses various um, relatively, shall I say, acceptable ways of taking your own life. Um, rather than, you know, putting a shotgun in your mouth mm -hmm. and leaving a mess for everybody... Uh, you know, 50 to 100 Tylenol tablets is just as effective and uh, a lot less gruesome. So, and there, are, I'm not even familiar with all of the techniques that they offer, but they offer a number of techniques uh, to patients who uh, choose this. I, you know, I, I think the other problem is it, it, 
not listening to patients. You know, majority of these patients are uh, over 65. Pain is, uh, uncontrolled pain is a common problem. Uh, and uh, we're in the middle of a situation where pain medications are viewed with some sense of um, concern and uh, there's a rising reluctance on the part of uh, physicians to prescribe uh, uh, aggressively for pain. There was a case in California several years ago now of an um, elderly gentleman who had severe pain who decided that he couldn't take it any longer. And whether his pain could have been controlled or not is irrelevant to the conversation. Uh, and he chose to um, uh, put his car in his garage, to hook a hose up to the tailpipe, and put the hose into the um, compartment of the automobile and uh, take his own life in that manner. Unfortunately for everyone, his granddaughter was asleep in the bedroom over the garage, and she also died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Hmm. So we have to be very careful about how we handle these challenging medical situations and uh, what, what is it exactly the patient wants or needs. And many of these situations, in truth, I concede, can be avoided by quality pain management or management of other uh, intolerable symptomatology, including depression. Um, I, I just think it's unfortunate that uh, well, that good medical care doesn't happen to take care of those situations, and th that um, physicians often don't have or take the time to explore with the patient exactly what it is they need and to see if it can't be done. That's very different than you know, the ability to prescribe perhaps unconventional doses of opiates and control a patient's pain is very different than uh, a, an in-stage chronic pulmonary patient who wants a ventilator withdrawn. I'd like to add, um, again, coming back to our relationship between the physician and the patient. <clears throat> I know that there have been instances where I've had a patient who was in their 40s or 50s that were, for example, be a very complicated diabetic whose quality of life was not particularly good, and discussing with them the pros and cons of starting dialysis as far as is this something you really think you want to go through where they were not a transplant candidate where they had multiple multiple comorbidities and again it comes first of all it comes back to communication and, and trust uh, between the doctor patient relationship but where we just said we're not going to start this because you always have to think about your end game. And is it something with, you know, high risk, low yield? Do you even want to get the get the ball rolling here? Because that can sometimes create more problems. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Brady mentioned a lot of our patients are over the age of 65. When you look at survival studies, uh, age is actually a very poor predictor. Uh, and I, I tend to look at it as functional age. I've had people in their 50s who were very poor surgical candidates for any type of surgical procedures. On the other hand, I've had patients in their 80s that have had open heart surgery and did well. So again, it's looking at how, from a physician point of view, how is this going to impact the patient? Is this really going to make their quality of life better or not? And if not, there are plenty of other avenues to make them as comfortable as possible. Um, and I think, again, that comes up to our, comes down to our clinical judgment, uh, along with, you know, again, the communication with the patient. Um, what I've noticed in, from what my anecdotal experience is worth, is that I, when I've had a patient 
who is on dialysis, who has been on for several years, whose quality of life starts to really go downhill. And I have the feeling it's time to have that talk. Most of the situations I've been in, it's almost like the patient and their family are waiting for me to initiate the conversation. It's almost like they want my permission. But isn't sometimes legally you're not able to bring it up first? Doesn't the patient sometimes have to bring it up first? Not that I'm aware oh. of. No, 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 not that I'm aware of. I mean, it's just like bringing up some type of modality of therapy. You know, okay. you can bring it up, but, you know, ultimately the patient um, has the right to acknowledge this or refuse it. But when I do have this conversation, it I almost get a sense of relief in a lot of cases with the patient and their family. And I usually bring up, remember that conversation we had when we started this? Well, we're having the conversation again now. And I cannot think of the last time a patient or their family refused this. And generally, I put this in context of, I want you to think about this and we'll discuss it in a few days or a week or two whenever you feel comfortable bringing this back up. So they don't feel like they're having a gun put to their head saying, okay, you have to do this right now because we've got somebody waiting for your spot. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I add is that I'm willing to respect whatever wishes you have. We can be as aggress aggressive as you'd like or as minimalist as much. All I ask is everybody be on the same page because this is not the time to start a family feud. Yeah. So Well, and I'm gra glad, I think this is a good segue because this is kind of what I wanted to go into is talking about more than just the experience of uh, the patient, but really the patient's family members, loved ones, friends, whatever it may be. And so I'd like to kind of start this with a story of my, my aunt who she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, oh, about 20 years ago. And after her diagnosis, I think she passed away within six months. And my mom said it was extremely traumatic because, um, you know, I'm sure you could go on about the disease a lot, Dr. Brady. She just completely withered away to a, essentially nothing. And they, of course, it was palliative care. They kept her comfortable. But she spent those last months of her life in a hospital. My mother said it was it was horrible for her to see, horrible for the family. I remember vividly my mom saying, I know it's in my genes. If I'm ever diagnosed with pancreatic cancer... I don't know how we're going to do it, but I'm going to die at home, surrounded by you guys, the dog. I want to make pottery. Now, in so what has been the experience for the family, and is it better or worse? How is it different, palliative care versus doing these kind of procedures? And after you guys answer that question, I would like you to then go into what if the patient and the family is not on the same page? Well, the advent of hospice and palliative care has made an enormous difference. Yes, yes. And I think particularly, you know, I've been around a lot of hospices and some of them are very good and some of them are terrible, you know, and the idea that, well, you know, the pain is just part of your illness and I'm sorry, um, is generally wrong. And I had an anesthesia friend, we were discussing this at dinner one evening, um, and uh, uh, there were well, maybe half a dozen of us at the table, and we were talking about doses and the enormous doses that some of us had used to control thousands of milligrams of morphine that we'd use to control pain in patients. That would and just talk about at dinner. Sometimes, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's on sports I, <laughs> dosages, <laughs> right? Yeah, this is what <laughs> oncologists talk about at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it happened that one of the fellows was an anesthesiologist uh, from Sloan Kettering, and he listened to this with some amusement. And after a, a, a little time, he, and we talked about the struggles and how you escalate doses and how quickly you can escalate doses and so on and so forth. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I can control anybody's pain in 15 seconds. And the thought was never lost on me. I, I, it, it was an amusing comment at the time, but the point is nobody needs to be in pain. Now, there certainly are, and I have had the conversation with patients. Where, you know, you can be pain-free, but you'll be asleep all the time. Uh, or you can be awake, and this is how it'll be. And sometimes you... 
um, go back and forth between those two extremes. The patient is sedated and they're comfortable and then you allow them to wake up and give them lower doses of an opiate and, and uh, this is what your life is like and you help me choose here. Uh, I think Dr. Baldwin's quite right. I, you know, if you look at, there was a, a book published by the Institute of Medicine probably 25 years ago talking about death in the medical care system in this country. And if you look at that book, communication is on virtually every page of that book. Yep. And it is so important to be able to just sit with the patient and figure out what it is they want and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And in my experience, prepping the patient, and, and this is sort of what Dr. Baldwin alluded to a minute ago, prepping the patient is invaluable. You know, we're going to reach a point in your illness where okay. our focus is, really is going to have to shift from active therapy to quality of life and comfort measures. And then when you get to that point, it's a lot easier for the patients to accept that, that that's where they are. Oh, yeah, we talked about that. And, and okay, if that's where we are, then we need to talk about how we're going to manage this aspect of my medical care in my life. Uh, and not surprising the patient uh, by saying, as so many physicians do, there's nothing more I can do for you. There's always something more we can do mm -hmm. for you. you know. And if it isn't active medical treatment directed at the disease, it certainly is uh, care directed at taking care of whatever other needs you have and the needs of your family. I think part of this, this whole uh, issue in, in society, like whether you're a physician and, or a uh, layperson, it's just understanding both sides of uh, of the debate and and uh, just being educated on the topic. So you mentioned uh, the anesthesiologist <coughs> says that he can take pain away within 15 seconds, and um, a lot of these times the, these patients are unconscious. Or when we give the medication to for physician assisted suicide, the patient's going to lose consciousness before they pass on. Mm -hmm. So how can we ensure? That an unconscious person is not in pain. Well, there is, uh, there are criteria. There's a, a system called the FLAC system, F-L-A-C-C, and you can find that on the web. And it's a way to grade patient behavior to give you some idea of how well the patient's pain is controlled or not. Um, it's a system that was developed at the University of Michigan. It's been validated and many, many places uh, use it. It's sort of a, the next step beyond the happy, sad faces if you feel like the patient can't find the words, but maybe the pictures help. This is sort of the next step. The patient can't communicate for whatever reason. Um, they may even be uh, or often are unconscious. And by observing the patient's behavior and grading it according to these five criteria, you can determine within a reasonable uh, absence of doubt, uh, the level at which the patient's pain is or is not controlled. I would like to add, um, and I think Dr. Brady made some excellent points, um, that somewhere in the middle of the spectrum as far as quality of life, and what I'm thinking of is that in patients, let's say you have a patient who is on dialysis, who has a lot of fluid issues, and um, you continue dialysis, but it's mainly for the for comfort measures, namely so their lungs don't fill up with fluids and they die drowning. You know, to me, I find that perfectly acceptable. I don't consider that to be extraordinary means if that's a situation. Another example in somebody who's not on dialysis is somebody who's severely anemic and short of breath, giving them a blood transfusion to help raise their oxygen carrying capacity. And these are kind of unusual circumstances, but they've been situations I've been confronted with as a clinician. So, <clears throat> you know, there is that gray area where, you know, 
you have to ask, is this going to enhance the patient's quality of life at the end? And, and again, that, that comes down to the physician and the patient's agreement. So, so what about now, uh, you know, you guys are the physician, me and Nick will be physicians one day. Uh, me and the patient are all on the same page. We, we agree that physician-assisted death is the way we want to go. Mm -hmm. Family members have a very different opinion. Uh, How do you treat that situation? What, and I think Dr. Brady and I both have been confronted with this, is you try to educate up to a point. But, you know, the card that we have ethically up our sleeve is ultimately our obligation is to the patient. And that is if the patient wants such and such done or not done, we have to respect the patient's right to choose as long as they're mentally competent or you have a good understanding of their wishes such as a living will or something like that. I'm sorry, I've never been in that situation. Really? Wow. But the situations I have been in are uh, a patient who is non compass menace, uh, who, in which the care is futile, and in, in which the medical team is in agreement that care should be withdrawn, the patient should be allowed to die. And the family, uh, for whatever reason, sometimes religious but often not, says no. You know, as long as dad's heart is beating, grandpa's heart is beating, we want you to do everything possible, keep him on the ventilator, and so on. In that situation, at least in the United States, most of us have the option of going to the ethics committee. Mm -hmm. And um, the ethics committee will listen to the concerns uh, of the family and will listen to the uh, perspective of the medical team and try and help as a neutral party um, eliminate the differences. Um, That doesn't always work. There are rare occasions where the family is committed irrevocably to uh, all life-sustaining measures uh, as long as uh, there's any heartbeat. And in that situation, uh, we had a a vernacular, which I won't repeat. (laughs) But the bottom line is, you cannot afford to keep people like that in the hospital. Those people have to be um, uh, moved on to uh, an extended care facility. Hospice? Uh, not always. I, I mean, remember, hospice is uh, not particularly interested, and and the way it's designed to, the payment system is designed, can't afford ventilators and various mm-hmm. kinds of therapy. So these people remain on <coughs> uh, some form of insurance and uh, go to specialized hospitals. And you know, in the case of our community, that, that I, if I recall correctly, the nearest specialized hospital is in Spokane, which per, puts a tremendous burden on the family. But remember, you're talking about a patient who, in most cases, can't communicate their wishes and doesn't know that they're withdrawn from family and doesn't know the family's driving three or four hours to visit them occasionally um, and that the family's... I, I have concerns about that, but... Again, if the patient can't participate in the decision-making process, you have to go by the expectations and requests of whoever is the next designated person. It's commonly the wife or spouse, but um, you know it depends on the state, it depends on the situation, is there a spouse, and so on and so forth. And this is where it can get tricky, and you really need to know the laws of your particular state or country in terms of uh, who are you supposed to listen to and who do you have to work with if you really see the care as being futile uh, to uh, achieve an appropriate medical outcome. So how do you guys, uh, or what are your thoughts on the kind of baseline question of the Hippocratic Oath 
do no harm and uh, many, I mean, doing harm as in assisting death. The controversy there. And or, I think that also a lot of people when they oppose physician-assisted suicide reference the Hippocratic Oath. So what would you say to those physicians or people? Doing no harm sometimes can be prolonging suffering. So, I mean, there are two sides to this. Mm -hmm. And if what I am doing is prolonging suffering for a patient, then I need to stop it. Because I think that you get into that ethical yeah. bind of, you know, the only advantage here is prolong, prolonging suffering. So, Well, and as physicians, we have multiple responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And certainly the patient is our number one priority. But we have a fiduciary responsibility to a system which is on the verge of bankruptcy. And uh, to, without forethought, continue care that we know is futile, um, I think is not fulfilling our responsibility to society. So it, it comes back around to this issue of communication. I need to sit down with the patient and or the family whoever can make decisions and say, look, this is the situation. One of the problems that we frequently confront in palliative care is um, the patient's very sick and they have multiple physicians. And the cardiologist comes around and says, well, you know, his heart's recovering from the infarction and his ejection fraction is up and, and uh, uh, we were able to uh, maybe taper the pressures a little bit. And the nephrologist comes around and says, well, you know, the kidneys are dead and I have to continue the dialysis. And the pulmonologist comes around and says, I can't wean the patient off of the ventilator. Uh, they fl funk, flunk every time. And the oncologist is saying, and in the background of this is a tumor that I can't treat and is progressing. And the family's focused on the fact that the cardiologist says his heart's better, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. things are better. And why would you do anything other than continue? And so getting all of the key players around the table with the family, and generally, in my experience, the people who are perpetrating positive information or injecting positive information into the situation can and will admit that it's <coughs> true his heart is better, but the reality is he's never going to recover from this situation, or she is never going to recover from this situation. And um, my colleagues are right that this is a situation where it's ventilator forever, it's dialysis forever, in the face of a progressing malignancy, uh, and perhaps the best thing to do is to withdraw, even though the heart is better. So getting all the physicians around the table with the concerned family can be uh, a very valuable thing to do. And it's sometimes a real challenge. I mean, I've actually had to get the chief of staff to tell physicians, you will be at this <coughs> meeting because we're all struggling with time commitments and mm -hmm. schedules and so on. But as Dr. Baldwin said, our core commitment is to the patient. And we can't ever let go of that. Now, as to the Hippocratic Oath, again, it's one piece of the obligations that we have. And there are a number of obligations that we have as physicians uh, that are sort of unwritten or understood societal contracts and appreciating those and recognizing those and accepting that um, sometimes there is a conflict between uh, your obligation to the patient and your obligation to society at large or to the patient's family and working to resolve those conflicts and being willing to invest the time 
that it takes to resolve those conflicts is critical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have to I have to agree because I've been like Dr. Brady in similar situations where you have uh, like call them dueling consultants, mm. and you have to some. And I've had to take a colleague or two aside and say, "Listen, you really need to go back and explain the the whole story here." Um, and again, that is our duty. And I think, and it comes down to again, not to sound like a broken record, comes down to communication. And um, I think that that is that is just really essential. And we do have multiple roles that we fill here. But again, you know, the, the discussing with the patient, you know, reasonable options and letting them have the say-so in it, I think, is our obligation as, as physicians. So I think one of the criticisms I hear a lot of this uh, treatment modality is very similar to a criticism of abortion. Essentially saying, doctors, you're playing God. So how do you respond to uh, individuals who criticize, uh, you know, physician-assisted death saying, you can't play God here, you're only the physician? <laughs> Let's end it there. <laughs> no, I, I, again, I, I think that this is not something that the physician says, George's time is up and I'm going to shoot him or squirt him with something or whatever, you know. This is a complex process that involves multiple physicians, Mm -hmm. is undertaken at the wish of the patient, and usually, again, in my experience, with the support of the family. I, I cannot remember a situation where uh, we've had these discussions and the family, there's been division within the family. Now, I certainly have been in situations, acute situations, where the patient is futilely ill and there's uh, division within the family about when to stop care. Mm. Uh, and, you know, being surprised like that Dad fell over this morning, and he was out for 10 minutes, and they managed to bring him back, but he's brain dead. Well, how do you know he's really brain dead? And you get into these terrible, complex, almost philosophical arguments. I I certainly, in in the acute setting, have had to deal with um, conflicts within family. But in terms of a physician suicide, that's usually been worked out with the family when the patient comes mm-hmm. to you. And um, uh, the family generally participates in these conversations. And any, I think, any responsible, it, it generally involves a psychiatrist or two. And any responsible psychiatrist is going to want to talk to the family to make certain that this guy or person is not sort of shining them on, making them think they're sane, but indeed there isn't any bizarre behavior going on in the background. So uh, the family's role is generally significant and supportive. Yeah, can you guys... Let, me, of, let me add something about the playing God uh, analogy or canard, as I would like to refer to it as. 150 years ago, if somebody had appendicitis, they died, okay? If they recovered from that because they didn't have appendectomies back then, it was considered a miracle, okay? Today, you have an uncomplicated appendicitis. You're in and out and live happily ever after. Um, so I think that, you know, just because we have, you know, we have technology now that we can do things that we couldn't do in the past. So... Um, and again, it comes down to uh, the wishes of the patient. And, and again, it comes down to our obligation to relieve suffering. And again, if it's do no harm means not doing something, then we, that means not doing something. In the acute situation, which, like Dr. Brady, I've been in a number of times, uh, where it, it was pretty clear this patient is not going to recover and or not have any type of functional recovery 
what I usually do is prep the pick, prep the family ahead of time of just saying, look, this is not going to work. You know, this is the outcome is going to be bleak. Give them a day or two. Let that sink in rather than, OK, we need a decision right now to take them off everything. When earlier that morning they had breakfast together, you know, pa families need a time for this to soak in. And I think that we're there to, you know, educate the families and kind of help them through it because, you know, there's more to lo losing a patient than just the patient dying. You, we mm -hmm. do have an obligation to the families, too. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's a good time to ask you guys about uh, one of the counter arguments is that a physician cannot always accurately assess lifespan. No. And so how accurate is that or and what is taken into account and how often are you right, how often are you wrong? I, I avoid it. So I avoid it. If somebody says, well, how much time do they have left? Uh, let's say start stopping dialysis. Um, are they actively infected? Are they eating? Are they, you know, I have to take other things into consideration. And I've had people withdraw from dialysis that were dead within 48 hours and other ones that have lived for two weeks. What about the assessment, though, that, to place them on hospice, or uh, which I think is the same six, six months, months for that's six physicians months. and suicide? That's, right? a different, that's a different ball game. That's for, for that, I think we can use our clinical judgment in our respective specialties and say, you know, okay, I don't think this person has much more than six months to go. Mm -hmm. And I th and again, it comes down to education of the patient and their families. Because I've heard some physicians say, like, we thought they had months and they lived for years. Is that really an accurate assessment? Well, I think things like that happen. But yeah. the reality is, uh, and I'll talk first from oncology and then from a more general perspective, Given in a given situation with a certain disease, you first of all you generally have you've seen known this patient. You generally have a sense of what the pace of the disease is, mm -hmm. and then you also know, uh, we, you know, we're meticulous about knowing median survivals and so on and so forth. So we certainly can sit down with patients and say, in this situation. The median survival is three months. And what that means is 50% of the patients don't make it three months and 50% of the patients make it three months, but, you know, 70% or so of the patients die within six weeks of three months. So you can explain the statistics to them in a way that makes sense. And are there exceptions? Yes. And do you want to gamble that you're an exception? And is the toxicity that you're going to uh, suffer or, um, from the chemotherapy or radiation therapy or surgery or whatever is planned, dialysis, uh, <clears throat> is the toxicity acceptable to you to try and see if you're in that small percentage, one, two, five percent, or uh, or is it not? And the conversation I often have boils down to quality versus quantity. And I talk to patients about quality versus quantity. And where are you with that discussion? And what's more important? Uh, because my ability often is to create toxicity without adding little, if anything, to the quantity of your life. Mm -hmm. So how would you like to go? You know, an extra month or so for maybe spend that whole time in hospital. I, how do you feel about that? And and again, I respect the patient's wishes. Um, I think the informed consent is so important because you can have, going off on what Dr. Brady said, you know, you can recommend a therapy or a modality that may increase the span of their life by a couple weeks, but you have to understand that this is probably not going to be quality couple weeks. It's not going to be able to be able to spend a couple weeks in Hawaii or something. Mm -hmm. They're going to be spending a couple extra weeks in hospice or in the hospital. And if that's what they want, that's fine. But I mean, I think really letting them know the full ramifications of a modality. 
So. Uh, let me tell you a story that is stuck in my mind because Dr. Baldwin brought up this issue of informed consent. I admit, first of all, as a disclaimer, that the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia is changing and is becoming a lot more effective and a lot more specific to the uh, genetic characteristics of the particular tumor. But for some 30 years, it wasn't very different. And early on, when we discovered that um, uh, anthracyclines, adromycin, or one of its conjugars, was key to not only getting a remission, but uh, getting a remission of reasonable duration. Uh, we also knew that that drug had significant cardiac toxicity. And I happened to have a patient in the bed against a window and the curtain was drawn. And the patient in the first bed was an elderly lady with cardiac disease who could not get out of bed without assistance. She was so crippled with rheumatoid arthritis and had just been diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. And one of my colleagues came in and said to her, you have leukemia, do you want to live? And she said, yes. And he said, fine, the chemotherapy will start within the hour. There was no discussion of the fact that the chemotherapy had an incredibly high mortality rate in her case, given her underlying cardiac disease. And indeed, she died within about three or four days. Uh, and that's not informed consent. And mm -hmm. I think the term informed consent is often... It's certainly a basic tenant of what we do, but it's often abused. Mm -hmm. And the kind of informed consent that Dr. Baldwin is talking about, where you really sit down with the patient and take the time to explain the pros and the cons, is unfortunately not done often enough. Maybe we're showing our generational age, Dr. Brady. <laughs> So how would you, though, talk to a patient, you know, talking about this concept of informed consent that, you know, especially with a, a cancer diagnosis and they're like, you know, I'm super positive, I'm going to beat this. And it, what if it's a rather uh, grim situation? You know, how do you inform that patient with also respecting their attitude of positivity where, you know, look, it doesn't look good. It, how are we going to handle this? I'd like to piggyback on that, on the same notion that, You've mentioned earlier you have an obligation to the patient's mm -hmm. best well-being and then also your future patients in society, uh, greater a greater society. And so like the reality of getting the oncologist, the nephrologist, the cardiologist, the pulmonologist all at one time talking to one patient to convince them. Or do you also, is this where family medicine comes in and uh, just the reality of getting them all in one spot, um, that seems like a, something that would be very hard to do. Uh, I think the family medicine person that the patient has known for a long period of time can be invaluable. Mm -hmm. They can be validating and they can help sort out this dueling consultants, as Dr. Baldwin put it. Um, and there have been times when uh, uh, I've actually called the patient's primary care. Would, would it be helpful for you to have your primary care person come in and talk with you? It's unfortunate, I think, that in this day and age, a lot of primary care physicians generally don't go to the hospital anymore. But most of them will respond to a plea to, could you come in and help us help this patient sort things out? And again... Uh, as Dr. Baldwin said earlier, you, you don't want to hold a gun to the patient's head. It's now or never make a decision. Come on, you know. I mean, these are things that have to be worked through. And people, they're terrible things. And people, we all know that Ben Franklin was right all those years ago. The two things that are certain in life are death and taxes. But <laughs> it's certainly very difficult when you begin to look the grim reaper right in the eye to make decisions. I've had people who have had living wills. I'm very clear about this. None of this feeding tube stuff. I don't want to be hooked up to machines. And you get to a point where you say, well, we're there. You know, We're not going to hook you up to a machine. We're not going to do anything dramatic. And they say, wait a minute. 
I didn't know when I signed that paper what it meant. I was 33 years old. Mm. And now that I'm 68 and I have a granddaughter due in three months, my perspective has changed. You know? So uh, I, caution and just, again, the communication. And sometimes it's painful, the, the amount of communication it takes to sort out a problem. One of my favorite stories is I, I had a patient who came in with um, uh, terrible abdominal pain. And we did a remarkable workup on this lady, and we couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. CAT scans, all nine yards. And we couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And she had quite significant abdominal pain. We opened her up, and she had disseminated malignancy that was sand-like throughout her abdomen. So it wasn't diagnosed on the CAT scan, um, but obviously couldn't be resected surgically. And she was pretty ill, and we didn't think that it was pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And we didn't think that chemotherapy was going to be terribly beneficial to her. And um, when she came back from surgery, we informed her of her um, situation, and her pain became unmanageable, hmm. absolutely unmanageable. Um, and uh, it was disturbing to us that there was this contrast between someone who had, had pain control, albeit with significant amount of opiates, who suddenly their pain is completely unmanageable. And in sitting down with this patient and having a long conversation, it was actually my nurse practitioner who did this, um, it turned out that she felt, because of the circumstances of her life and her religious beliefs, that she was uh, going to hell. Uh, and um, we needed to find an appropriate practitioner of her faith to come and talk to her about the situation and uh, perform some um, procedures, which one might call miracles, and uh, uh, assure this lady that because of the words he'd said and the things that he'd done, that he had relieved her of the responsibility of this terrible thing that she thought she'd committed, and her pain was easy to manage after that. Hmm. So here's an example of somebody who's not in physical pain at all. It was all existential pain, mm -hmm. and or to the most part. And um, finding the right practitioner, in this case it required a religious person, but finding the right practitioner to manage the patient's discomfort is critical. In that situation, does it even really need to be a practitioner or maybe just someone of uh, matching religious preferences, essentially, like a clergy person or something. Well, this patient, was a case, it was a clergyman. Oh, okay. It was okay. a clergyman, but, uh, um, uh, it, it, yeah, I, you know, I hate to be gauche, but whatever works. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, if it's a fellow church member I need to talk to about this, fine. If it's one of the clergy, if it's the, one of the hierarchy in the clergy, fine. I think that's their obligation to that they make to their uh, uh, the members of their faith. And, uh, and I, you know, one of the things that's critical here is we can't fall into the trap that we're responsible for solving all of these problems. Again, in that case, there was no way medically we could have solved that woman's problem. Um, we would have just pumped more and more morphine into her, uh, probably unsuccessfully. And it really required uh, a uh, minister from her church to come and spend some time with her. And there were some rituals that were involved and that put her completely at ease and eliminated... I, I'm seriously, I'm serious. We went from very high, very unconventional doses of morphine that were completely unsuccessful to routine post-operative 
uh, doses of morphine for somebody who'd had a laparotomy. Wow. Um, so I guess a question I kind of have, sort of transitioning to a new topic, essentially another one of the criticisms I hear quite often, uh, physician-assisted suicide, and essentially this phrase I feel like is used in criticizing many different things, whether it's uh, abortion or gun control, is if we do this, if we open up this, it's a slippery slope. If we open up this, uh, if we say this is appropriate, it's just going to continue to lead to more appropriate situations. And like you always hear, it seems like on a lot of conservative news outlets, slippery slope, slippery slope. And I do think it's in some respects that is valid. I've heard, I was actually watching a documentary this morning about a woman in the Netherlands who is 24 years old who was able to uh, carry out euthanasia. And so when do you two feel that uh, this sort of procedure, physician-assisted death, is warranted and is appropriate? I think that it comes down to, in part, again, communication, but also our professional judgment, too. I mean, I think that that, and uh, understanding of you know, current ethical guidelines and that. So it's something that, you know, is not an isolated yes or no. I think you really have to take a lot of factors into consideration, just as we do in treating somebody with complicated medical problems who comes in with pneumonia. Um, but I guess, have you ever been in situations where a patient has broached this topic and you have thought, no, this is not appropriate? Yes, and I've told them so. Yes, same. I, I, I have too. And uh, the other side is that I've been in situations where it's perfectly appropriate, but where the process takes so long. I mean, this is not something that you can come to my office tomorrow and get a script and go home. Mm -hmm. You know, there are waiting periods. There are other consultations. And I've had patients who come in and say, look, I, I'm at the end of the road. I want the script. Uh, I you know, mm -hmm. my life is just, it's just not worth it. I can't, the, the pain pills make me nuts. Uh, I, I can't live like this. You, you've got to help me. And my answer is, I appreciate your situation. You are at the end of your life. I'm proud of you for recognizing that. But the process takes two or three months. And you're not going to live that long. And starting down that road is a waste of your energies. And you need to focus on what you can and want to do in the meantime. And I will do the best I can to manage the symptoms that you have. And meaning the process of two to three months of physician-assisted suicide, is it, you mean like you have to go through the psyche valve and the second psyche valve? Is that kind of what you're referring to? Yes, but there are also waiting periods. There are built-in oh, waiting okay. periods. Is right? it two weeks or something? Around? That's a... I can't remember exactly, but at one point there's a, <coughs> a, at least a month waiting period. Mm -hmm. So it, to get to the prescription, um, and again, this isn't something that I do very often and haven't done for a long time, but I, it, I as I recall, take, in the state of Washington, it takes about three months to get to the prescription. So if you say, look, I've got Lou Gehrig's disease and I can't eat and I'm choking on everything and I had four bouts of pneumonia in the last three days, um, I, I, you know, let's, let's pull the plug today. I, you can't do it. Yeah. I think also is understanding, and we all recognize the stages of loss or the stages of dying. The patients go through, families go through the same thing. And I think understanding that uh, part of part of our role as physicians is not only educating the patients but educating the family and understanding where they're at. And I think that that again, that's where an organization like hospice, palliative care plays a really good role in helping to reinforce that education. You know, one of my concerns about palliative care, and I think this is pretty universal, is that you know, you get to a certain point and say, well, we're going to call a palliative care doctor and, you know, I go see him. And if you've been under my care, Dr. Baldwin's care for years, there's a sense of abandonment in that. Mm -hmm. And it's just like what we talked about earlier, bringing in the primary care physician that they've known for 20 years, you know. 
I think that some continued involvement of the core team is important. Uh, and if my skills as an oncologist are in at pain control are pretty paltry, then I need to get the palliative care team involved when the patient has pain early on, because some of these patients require industrial doses of opiates, doses that you would never talk about in a pharmacology class mm -hmm. or, or consider in a post-operative setting. And I think another thing is, is it, which is, I think, kind of unique to Dr. Brady's and my specialties, is that we tend to have very close relationships with our patients because we see them quite often. I know for me, patient in a dialysis unit, I'm seeing them at least once a week. So I became or become the de facto primary care doc for these patients, and I do straddle both inpatient and outpatient. And I know that um, in other specialties that um, we kind of assume the role of primary care doc and mediator of sorts between dueling specialties if it comes down to that. Mm -hmm. And again, I think recognizing if we're put in that situation that to take that responsibility. So. You know, I, I'm sitting here thinking about your core question here is the issue of physician-assisted suicide. And I think it's impressive that in a number of states, and in particular Oregon and Washington, it's actually the population, not the government, who said, we want this option. Um, and we should respect that. And the physician, and Dr. Baldwin pointed out, the profession has grown over time. There was a time when appendicitis was a deadly disease. It isn't any longer. Um, and I think the profession is really struggling with uh, growth in this area. And I think the conversation that the conversations that are had in this area in 50 years will be very different than the conversations we're having right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a little, like what I've been a little confused about looking this up is, so I mean, this essentially comes down to law, but then we have organizations like the AOA, the AMA, ACP, ACOI, yeah. who they say, we do not support this. And what's a little like odd to me about this is can I can I interrupt you real quick? The, yeah. Can you explain to the listeners? You just used a few acronyms. Can you explain what those are? So AOA is American Osteopathic Association, and then AMA is American Medical Association, ACP American College of Physicians, and ACOI is American College of Osteopathic Internists. So Dr. Brady, you are you a member of ACP? Yes. And Dr. Baldwin's a member of ACOI. Um, and they each, they so that's what I wanted to ask you guys. It's like, it's it seems odd that you have all of these members and then these organizations come out and they say we oppose this or we support this. Yet, this is essentially leadership speaking on behalf of all the members, and there could be a large number of members that disagree with this statement. Um, and then. But the reality is, is that statement doesn't have any control over how things are practiced and done, and that actually is decided by the vote of the people. Mm -hmm. um, so can you just kind of, I guess, better explain that landscape? Um, or I, I guess I would start by saying it, it, physicians tend to be uh, conservative by nature. Obviously, the words that uh, we've used for centuries to describe what we do, first to no harm, the Hippocratic Oath, and so on, um, are part of our culture, and uh, there's a commitment 
or maybe even a belief system on the part of many physicians that we have to take that literally. Um, and, and I think there are a number of us who believe that the world is a changing place and mm -hmm. it's evolving. And we certainly need to have this conversation because the public, our patients, expect it of us. You know? And I think if you're uncomfortable, it's one of the things um, I, I talk about uh, sometimes when I'm asked about abortion. I think if you're uncomfortable with that, if it isn't something you do, and the patient's interested, then you should send the patient to someone they can talk to about it. It's look, it's getting the patient to the specialist who can meet their needs. You can't control their pain. Get them to a palliative care specialist who can. You can't manage their depression. Get them to a psychiatrist who can. Um, and uh, you don't believe in physician-assisted suicide, and this is very important to the patient. Get them to somebody who can have the appropriate conversations. So is there any obligation? So if someone, in so their core beliefs they do not support it, and they do not want to be an enabler of that act. Is there any repercussions? Are they are they obligated to refer, or can they just say, uh, "You can't." Sorry, I can't help you there. I th think, and I, I wish I'd brought the ACP core ethics uh, guidelines with me, but I think we are obligated to refer. Uh, we are not obligated to take any action that is we're uncomfortable with, mm -hmm. but we're obligated to refer. I agree. I agree with Dr. Brady. We have an obligation. Again, it comes back to our obligation to our patients. And um, pa yeah, and I sometimes have told patients that you know you and I don't have to agree on everything, but what I'm here to do is to you know give advice. And if they want uh, a modality that I am incapable of rendering, like delivering a baby, or doing surgery, I will get them to somebody who can. And I think that, again, it's up to, we have an obligation as physicians to respect the rights of our patients. And let me give you an even more tense example. I've been in situations where patients demanded chemotherapy, and I felt it was totally inappropriate, and I just could not justify giving the chemotherapy. The patient and I have a conversation about that, and I tell them, I have to withdraw from your care. I, I, I'm just completely uncomfortable uh, providing the kind of care that you want. But I will help you find a physician who can do that or will do that or whatever it is a patient wants and have sent patients on to other oncologists who are willing to um, treat to the bitter end. I have been in the same situation myself where I have felt that there was a, an ethical issue arising that I did not feel that further aggressive care was going to do anything but harm the patient. And it usually wasn't so much driven by the patient, but many times by families and the patient did not have a living will or um, were non compass menti. Uh, so, you know, they said, well, we want everything done and explain to them that inevitably, no matter what we do, the end result is going to be death and it's going to be fairly soon. And I did not feel comfortable ethically of continuing this because I felt it was going to harm the patient and have, like Dr. Brady said, referred them to other people who would. Mm. I have been, I've also had patients referred to me in a similar situation where they said, you know, I have to agree with Dr. Jones that anything further would be harmful to the patient. And um, I am not going to assume care because I do not feel ethically that this is going to be best for the patient. Mm -hmm. so. so bringing this uh, kind of back to a convert. A topic, I guess, of appropriate situations. So I kind of look at both of your careers uh, as an oncologist, as a nephrologist. You do have the luxury of imaging modalities that can give you a good idea of what's going on. 
Um, you can take biopsies. You can measure kidney function. You kind of alluded to earlier that, uh, you know, in situations of like psychiatric illness, um, where we kind of think of this as maybe a treatable illness, but I'm sure all of you, and I know I've met people who for decades have tried to treat their depression or schizophrenia and haven't had any success. So do you feel in those situations, those patients should be entitled to the same modalities that uh, a terminal uh, pancreatic cancer diagnosis or like how, how would you address those situations where it's not easy to really measure how severe their illness is? It's much more subjective as opposed to the objectivity of what Dr. Brady and I do. Uh, I've never been in that situation, but I would just off the top of my head say that I would want to have a number of supporting opinions and absolutely no other option there. Mm -hmm. So I think that would that would be the kind of the goalposts of the argument in an area of psychiatric illness. So. Yeah, you'd want multiple right. conferring psychiatrists. And the problem with that, but you alluded to it the way you phrased your question, is it would take an enormous amount of time. Mm -hmm. Right, because the psychiatrist is going to want to try this drug or that drug, right. and there are certain time limits on which during which you try the drug, and and review the patient's prior experience, and obviously embark on some form of uh, verbal therapy, psychotherapy, uh, and the, I can see where that would be um, very difficult for the patient, uh, and a lengthy process for the patient. Uh, but I think that because it is so subjective, uh, it would take a lot of us a, a while to get comfortable with mm -hmm. with that as an option. And yeah. like one of the essential symptoms of depression, you know, bipolar disorder, you name it, is wanting to kill yourself. So it's like, how do you or know? Or wanting if, to die. Yeah. 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 You know, how do you know if that's really uh, how they truly feel? Is or that if it's the just disease a, or yeah. is this the end result? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. No, it's, and again, it's all subjective. We, you know, it's just like with pain. We can't draw a serum pain level on patients. And pain does have some subjectivity associated with it cultural backgrounds, how they were raised, uh, a number of different things. And, you know, Dr. Brady and I have had the experience of some patients that, you know, you could take a chainsaw and cut off their legs and they would barely admit to any pain. And other people that, you know, would have something relatively minor and you'd think that they were dying. So you, you really, you have to take a lot of things into consideration as opposed to, you know, with, with our specialties doing a test of some kind that can say yes or no, mm -hmm. you know, again, in the area of psychiatric illnesses, it, it's so subjective. Mm -hmm. so. Can we go back to, uh, like for the sake of patient education and making informed decisions, can you guys explain the drugs that are prescribed and how a, the body would actually shut down and, and how physician assisted death would all play out from like, a reality physiology standpoint well in Washington it's a barbiturate and you're just heavily sedated and respiration cease or if they gave opiates it would be the same thing right? when the respirations would stop so there's there's no pain and, and how long would that take um, it depends on the uh, Pharmacology of the drug, right? <laughs> Perfect pharmacologist answer. It depends, yeah. And the state of their liver and a few yeah. other things. Right. Yeah. But generally, in Washington, uh, it takes two to four hours. Okay. Um, an experience I've had probably more commonly is withdrawal from dialysis, um, where they just kind of slip into a coma and it's it's actually not a bad way to go. They're not in any pain. Uh, they're not in any kind of extremis or anything like that. Um, so, I mean, I've witnessed this with my own eyes in patients of mine who have stopped dialysis. So, um, you know, generally any medication put on top of that would just kind of hasten things. You know, again, if they're in pain, that, that that's 
perfectly appropriate. Well, and I, you know, in the situation where we do a palliative withdrawal of ventilator, I always premedicate the patient with yes. morphine. And then I have morphine, additional morphine at the bedside so that if there's the perception on my part or the part of the family mm -hmm. that this patient is in distress, they get more morphine. Mm -hmm. There's a concept of uh, dual effect. And it basically states that it depends on why you're doing what you're doing. Might, might the morphine hasten their death? Yes, it might. Uh, but I'm not giving the morphine to kill them or to hasten their death. I'm giving them morphine so they're comfortable. Mm. And I think that's a very, very important distinction that is it's for treating pain or making them comfortable as opposed to ending their life. Mm. So... Regard, uh, to go back to that story you mentioned earlier of the man in California who incidentally uh, killed his granddaughter as well. Yes. So one thing that um, I didn't like understand fully before looking at this a little bit was the difference between phys physician-assisted death where you prescribe medications that they can, and they take them home and then euthanasia where a drug is administered. And I was a little surprised uh, to learn that in an, the United States or in the states in the United States that have this legal is that we're due physician assisted death because it seems like there is a lot of room for error um, if you prescribe medications you don't know when they'll take them or where they'll take them and it seems like it would be a controlled environment if you did euthanasia but I understand the difference between actively doing it and assisting and so uh, it comes down also again to education of the patient and their family you know, that if they wish to go that route, okay, this, you know, this is available and these are the situations. Well. And usually there are assistants. Yeah. They're plugged into a program. And okay. so there are professionals in the home who uh, stay in the home with the patient and the family through the process. So they're not alone. I, I can only recall one instance where a patient took their own life uh, alone it was what they chose to do. Um, but generally, the, there's assistance, uh, the, you know, the, all the consultants they've seen, and then there are staff who, um, they get plugged into the program, there's a program, and uh, so there are professionals in the home. And it's... Uh, I would say 90% or so, at least in the Oregon experience, 90 plus percent of the deaths occur in the home. And it's, you know, it's when you talk to patients, if you just sit down and talk to people or go stand outside Macy's and interview people today, you know, where would you want to die? Oh, I'd like to die at home, you know. I, I, I don't want to. Most people don't want to fall out of a tree in the Blue Mountains. And or probably be stuck in a hospital. Die by, <laughs> or be stuck in a hospital. Mm -hmm. You're right, absolutely right. They, they prefer not to be in institutions. So um, a lot of this, and the data can sometimes be hard to interpret because a lot of those patients are already on hospice also. So, But hospice, uh, as you gentlemen know, doesn't mean that you're in an institution. In this country, at least, most of the patients mm -hmm. are at home. And I think that, you know, again, we talk about societies changing in that. I mean, there was a time half a century ago when it was not uncommon. Well, if a patient was terminal, we don't want to upset them and tell them they're dying. Well, at one point or another, people figure that mm -hmm. out. And I think that we've gone to a, a much better place where we're informing people up front as far as this is this is what you have. This is the... Uh, if there's a therapy, these, this is the therapy, you know, here's the, here's what we hope to get, but in reality, here's what also can happen too. And again, it comes down to communication. And I really get kind of what Nick was saying. I really get frustrated by the idea that, uh, essentially euthanasia is not legal in the United States, at least to my knowledge, because I feel a lot of patients who might be most appropriate for this situation 
are maybe paralyzed or maybe they're going through uh, essentially Alzheimer's where they just simply don't understand what's going on, but they voice that this is something that they wanted to do when they still had the mental mm-hmm. capacity. So how would you advise me and Nick moving forward in our careers? How can we be better advocates for our patients to um, essentially get euthanasia uh, allowed it, when it is you know, necessary? Well, I, I guess it depends on... Or do you think is it? The yeah, situation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What do you think it is? So palliative removal of a ventilator, in my estimation, is euthanasia. You're doing an active act, overt act, that you know is going to result in the death of the patient. Mm-hmm. Or withdrawal of di- or stopping dialysis. That's another example. Yeah, we, and we think that's perfectly legitimate and an important thing for us to think about and consider. And it's part of our responsibility, our fiduciary responsibility to the society and so on. Um, I, you know, I've been very clear with my family that uh, there are a lot of ways to keep somebody with Alzheimer's alive that are fairly straightforward, feeding tubes and so on and so forth, that I don't want. Mm-hmm. You know, if I can't carry on a meaningful conversation, let's be real clear. Mm-hmm. One of the problems with the standard forms and languages and I mentioned this earlier, is it's often hard to conceive what that really means. Now, for me, as a physician, I, 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 we looked at the living will, my wife and I, part of our wills, and we modified that significantly. So it's pretty clear. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you're 30 and you have your first kid and you think I should have a will and oh yeah there should be a living will part of it and yeah if, if I'm in an extreme situation I wouldn't want anything crazy done then you know when you're 75 and looking the grim reaper right in the eye you may not feel quite the same way so as society evolves people evolve mm-hmm. and we change our views of what's extreme <laughs> right. and what's acceptable as we go along. So I think it, it, it is important that, uh, particularly as primary care people, if that's where you end up, that you visit the topic from time to time. Um, you know, and it's particularly easy to do, uh, this is an oncologist speaking, who thinks he's had some really difficult conversations, <coughs> it's particularly easy to do when it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You know? You know, if this came up, George, how would you feel about it? What do you think about that? You know, or you told me once a long time ago this. Do you still feel that way? Um, in case I should ever be called upon to adjudicate a si- difficult situation. So I, I think having those conversations at a time when they're, if you will, not relevant can be very valuable. They're easy to have. They're not threatening. As Dr. Baldwin said, the gun isn't to the patient's head, you know, uh, is, is a, an important thing to do. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the way it is now is a patient needs a terminal illness diagnosed or be diagnosed with a terminal illness. Correct. Um, and they have to be able to take the medication themselves. Correct. So is it, do you, do you guys think it should go in this direction or do you think it's likely to go in this direction? The possibility of, say, you have Alzheimer's or Huntington disease in your family where it's inevitable or likely that you will get to a point where you are no longer the same person and put in a living will, essentially, that when I get to the point where I cannot do this, this, or this, based on whatever you agree with you and your family, uh, I would want euthanasia basically to take place I leave that to the lawyers <laughs> get them involved too yeah I, I um, that is from my perspective that's tricky business yes um, uh, but it, you know an advanced Alzheimer's patient can't feed themselves mm-hmm. and uh, don't you be feeding me gruel that's all I have to say. I don't, you know, and I think, uh, again, as primary care physicians, you can talk through that. And uh, as we get better at diagnosing Alzheimer's 
early on, uh, patients can plan better too. You, you know, I've had conversations with patients where I think their prognosis is uh, two or three months and they want to be treated, but they've always wanted to go to Greece. Well, you know, guess what? You better go to Greece and then we'll talk about the therapy, mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on how you feel when you get back. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, again, it comes back to the communication and the patient's wishes. So when you guys say, uh, like, if, or you said how if you were an Alzheimer's patient and you got to the point where you just got, like, I don't want this measure taken, this measure taken, like, we're not going any farther, are uh, you saying withdrawal treatment, essentially, uh, to, like, as in feeding tubes and whatever's necessary? Or not initiating them. So wouldn't, um, it seems like starvation, death by starvation uh -huh. would be worse than, like, euthanasia? Gen generally not. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people in the kinds of situations that we're talking about um, are, are not particularly aware of hunger. Right. So yeah. it's not like they're actively wanting something to eat and are able to eat and you're withholding it. Oh, okay. Again, these patients have many other things that are going on, and if they're not... You know, for example, if they have advanced dementia, uh, they will not be aware of certain things. So, you know, one thing is withdrawing care. The other thing is not initiating something without, for lack of better terms, an exit plan. Mm -hmm. Of really, as a, as a clinician saying, okay, I'm going to start this, but, you know, let's look down the road couple days, couple weeks, couple months, is this going to be the right plan or not? Mm -hmm. So I think of this... Does that, does that answer your question? Now? Yeah. I, I just think of this uh, podcast that Logan and I had listened to uh, prior to this, and maybe we can put it, you can put it in the show notes or something. Sure. But it was about, uh, it was a man from Canada, and he had, a, he had a terminal diagnosis, and he was going through the process of euthanasia. And they kind of just, they documented his whole last few months and they had a funeral for him, but he was at the funeral and all of his closest family and friends were there. And like prior to that, he had gone on, like it was fall and like he loved fall walks and seeing the leaves change and all these things. It was like, he knew it was his last time. He just, he cherished it and he was departing on his own terms and having all of his closest family and friends there. And and knowing knowing what the outcome is going to be, people were more honest and and real because of what they knew was coming next. And I think that human nature people avoid that because it, I mean it, it, we we just do. And it was a it was a beautiful thing to see a living funeral basically. And I think of if you were to basically just not do treatment and see someone wither away you're taking away that or you just don't have that option maybe of doing it that way which i thought just turned out very meaningful um i just i don't know what do you guys think of of, of that having that option or i feel like the way it is now you don't have that option it's again it goes by a case-by-case -case basis i mean i i don't want to sound like a politician mm -hmm. but it really comes down to a case-by-case -case basis. So, Dr. Brady? <laughs> yeah. Families and patients respond differently. Mm -hmm. And so what you saw was something that was very, very positive. It might not be so positive in other situations. So should, should euthanasia be legal so people do have that option? Um... I would say I haven't made up my own mind about that. Mm -hmm. I do think that's a really challenging ethical question, whereas I think physician-assisted suicide, at least for me, is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. In particular, because as I said before, we do overt acts that result in the death of patients. And to draw these artificial lines between uh, these acts um, may make some people comfortable, but hopefully 
Well, I think actually the society at large kind of recognizes their artificial lines mm -hmm. and it's physicians who struggle with the reality of that. And perhaps we feel some responsibility for um, the lives entrusted to us. I mean, I certainly have cried over deaths, gone to funerals and so on. And um, you, you do feel a commitment, but we all have to recognize that we aren't God. <laughs> you know, if we were God, we'd wave a magic wand and you would rise from your bed and go home, you know. Um, and so doing the best we can uh, in the circumstances that are presented to us and the patient is what we really need to do. And sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. So uh, we're coming up almost on 100 minutes here. So I think one, <laughs> one way I always like to kind of conclude podcasts is I say, okay, imagine, um, you know, we have a patient sitting here who has a terminal illness who's just kind of breaching this idea of carrying out this modality. How would you advise that patient to start the conversation with their doctor or their spouse, uh, their child? Like, how would you give advice to that patient? I would encourage them to find out where they live, what the process is, mm -hmm. so that they have an understanding of what the process is. Uh, and, and to also probably have the conversation with their family before they bother to have the conversation with the doctor. Because if there's going to be conflict within the family, it's probably best to try to resolve that before you... Uh, approach the medical community about uh, where you're going to go. I, I think what patients have described to me is um, <coughs> not so much opposition as, as Dr. Baldwin put it earlier, it, it triggers the grieving process. Oh, God, Dad really is going to die, you know, and okay, I have to come to grips with this and I'll go home and cry. And, you know, you do the things that Kubler-Ross describes, deny. Um, and I think to allow a patient and or family to live in denial uh, right to the last minute is not a humane thing to do. And, you know, patients are smart. I had a patient call me last night. This is a really good friend. And he called me up and he said, look, this is what's going on with me. And the, I, I saw a cardiologist in the emergency room and he said he was going to admit me and do this surgery. And I said, no way, I have to think about it. You know, I mean, this has been going on for months and all of a sudden it's an emergency and I have to have surgery tonight or tomorrow morning. And... I said to him, you know, in listening to all that you've told me about your medical history, and this was a conversation that probably took close to an hour, I think you're right. You know, I think you are being pressured to do something that may or may not be correct. And I think you need to get out of the healthcare system you're in, get into an entirely different healthcare system, see this kind of specialist, and see what they think is an appropriate therapy because it was very clear that one aspect of his care was completely wrong, was completely wrong, and that he had seen multiple physicians and a subspecialist, and nobody had bothered to implement this one particular medication that was absolutely indicated. Hmm. It was stunning to me, you know. I'm going to talk to you about admitting you to the hospital and cutting you open, but oh, well, I forgot about this medication. Um, I, I, you know, and he felt uncomfortable. He didn't think things seemed right, and he wanted to talk to some people he knew. And uh, I, I, you know, can I tell him what he should do? No, I'm not a cardiologist. He needs a cardiologist. He needs an electrophysiologist, but. I can certainly tell him that, yeah, I'm uncomfortable too with the way things are going and what's happening. And I think if patients f feel that way, they should ask questions. And, uh, I, you know, I always, in fact, sometimes I insisted on the second opinion. 
I believe that if you have a physician who doesn't think you need a second opinion, you need a different physician. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think along with what Dr. Brady says, I think we've both encountered uh, colleagues in different specialties whose uh, main focus was their own enrichment by doing procedures rather than what's best for the patient. You know, I've, I've known of nephrologists who have dialyzed patients, in my opinion, inappropriately, where there was no benefit in actually prolonging suffering rather than having that conversation of saying, you know, do you really think this is helping you? And, you know, then that gets into almost would probably be another podcast. But again, it has to do with with communicating with the patients and, and explaining to them costs, benefits of any modality. Um, because I, I've had, my patients have had the same experience that Dr. Brady mentioned, where, you know, people have come in and said, okay, you know, here's what we have to do, rather than, you know, just saying, you know, in your case, it may help, but probability is it's not going to help. On the other hand, I've worked with, um, I can think of a cardiology group uh, that I worked with back in the Midwest who, uh, if you had any type of complicated cardiac problem um, where there wasn't a clearly de defined quick benefit, they'd say, well, this is all we can do. We're going to recommend you go to hospice. Well, that may not be appropriate at that time. And again, that's listening to your patient and, you know, kind of putting your own stuff aside and doing, okay, this is what's best ethically for the patient. Uh, Nick, any last final thoughts here? No, I mean, it's, uh, well, yeah. Uh, we, it's, it's funny, you can talk about this for what, over an hour and a half now. And there's still much, so still so much like indecision, and like I, I there's no clear answer, and it's because we're dealing, because we are human beings, and we're dealing with human beings, and not mm -hmm. every human being is the same. Uh, contrary to what advertising tells you, I mean, <laughs> as I like to say, sometimes patients read textbooks, sometimes they don't, and this is why we have to individualize our care. We're not medical vending machines. And I think any doctor who tries to practice that way is doing a disservice to his patients and to our profession. I think that is the perfect answer to your question, Nick. I mean, we're all individuals. And the people we deal with are all individuals. And um, recognizing that, no two cases are going to be the same. Mm -hmm. No two scenarios that start out looking very similar are going to spin out the same way in the long run. And I think for a lot of physicians, the ambiguity of it all makes them crazy. Mm -hmm. They can't deal with the ambiguity. I have an answer. This is the answer. It's mm -hmm. yes or no, it's black or white. And mm -hmm. the skill as a good physician, and particularly as a good primary care physician, is dealing with the ambiguity. Right, and being comfortable with it. And, and sometimes you don't have an answer. I, I can tell you early, early on in my medical education, when I was a third-year student, on my very first rotation as a third-year student working with an internist who... I may add to this day, I think is one of the best doctors I ever worked with. I remember him telling a patient and their family, right now we don't know what's going on with you, but we're going to proceed in a certain manner, and if it requires getting consultants in, then we will. But to hear somebody who I respected admit that they didn't have all the answers was kind of really important for my development as a physician that I don't have to come up with all the answers. Sometimes, yeah, we have to say, wait and see. I, I will tell patients, you know, 
you have to take my least favorite medication, and that's a dose of time. Yeah. You know, I mean, patients get better on TV in a half hour in between commercials. In the real world, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that, again, being comfortable with our limitations as physicians, even with all the high-tech procedures, medications, and modalities, you know, again, we're still dealing with individual people. And setting their expectations. What yes. Dr. Baldwin just said reminded me of the disparity between the success rate of cardiopulmonary resuscitation on TV and, <laughs> and, and the success rate in real life. I yes. Mean, it's something yeah. like 30 80, you know. Right. I can't remember the exact numbers. Yeah. But it's, there's this huge disparity between cardiopulmonary resuscitation success and, uh, you know, the public is watching the friggin' TV. They're not going to codes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, so, you know, we've said it many times in the course of this, it's a communication mm -hmm. with the patient and working out, and a two-way communication with the yep. patient. Oh, no, I think that, yes. And I think that, you know, we have a unique relationship as physicians, and I would use the term sacred uh, relationship in the non-religious version, but I think that the relationship uh, between a lawyer and a client, between a therapist and a client, between um, a minister and their congregant, and between a physician and a patient is sacred. We take an oath that we will not violate that. If you violate that, you can be in a lot of trouble, and justifiably so. You know, we've, Dr. Brady and I, I can guarantee you have had patients tell us stuff that they have never told another person and I have never revealed it you know and that is part of our obligation to the patient and it comes down to our our you know our, our ethical obligations to what's best for our patient so well you know speaking on behalf of Nick as well I know we both feel incredibly honored that you guys took the time out of your weekend schedule to sit down with us and kind of explore this gray aspect of medicine, this gray area of medicine. And especially, you know, for me, it feels like a great refresher because me and Nick are in the midst of memorizing all these facts for our <laughs> board exam. It seems very binary, right or wrong. And then you guys really explained how in the, the aspect, in the press, pr uh, practice of medicine, it's not like that at all. And how we communicate with our patients, it's really not going to be like this. Um, being the father of a uh, soon-to-be 16-year-old daughter uh, who everything is absolute black and white and who has all the answers, <laughs> I remember those days, and now I have very few answers and everything's gray. I wish I was as wise as my 16-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. what was it? <laughs> Twain said, just for fun, you can cut this out. Twain said, when my father, when I was 16, my father was so ignorant. I was embarrassed to be seen with him. And when I was 21, I was astounded at how much the old gentleman had learned in five years. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. I think that's a, I'm waiting a, for that, Dr. Brady. I think that's a great way to uh, end it right there. <laughs> Thank you for asking.